Carla, I, well, I have a statement full of questions, so okay. if there's any time at the end, I'll get to them. I'm, I'm very conscious also that the statement I have me on, there's so many questions that are in it may actually be addressed in the guidelines that are being issued tomorrow. So I can't understand why we didn't get the guidelines in advance. There was also a frustrating aspect of the July and summer provision that was announced Friday week, that we had a session on the Wednesday in the July and summer provision, and then the announcement was made on a Friday. I'm, I'm new to this chamber. That seems nonsensical to me that we can't actually scrutinise these decisions in advance. But anyway, I'll continue. In the early days of the pandemic, the mantra that we clung to was that speed trumped perfection. It was a powerful and it was an appropriate message that was issued from our own Dr. Michael Ryan in his capacity of the Chief, in Chief Executive of the World Health Organization. It was a message that was quickly appropriated by the Irish government to deflect criticisms, criticisms where actions taken during the pandemic didn't meet the standards of what was required, be that in testing capacity, in confused messaging around this, the necessity of PPPE, or the exclusion of women returning from maternity leave from accessing the temporary wage. Speed trumps from perfection, we are told, in the midst of a global pandemic and a national crisis, we all attempted to engage constructively and accepted that to be a reasonable justification. But how do I apply that same standard to the Department of Education and Skills? Well, once again, I sit here in this chamber in June, in late June, with absolutely no guidance yet forthcoming in my hand about what the education will look like once the doors open, be that in a couple of weeks for the summer provision or else in late August. Decisions taken by the department today have been arguably enormous as they have been. They've been painfully slow. They've contributed to increased anxiety for students, for parents, and according to the educators and the professionals in that sector I've worked to, it's, it's consequences in an element of disrespect being shown to the sector. I mean, when we talked about closing the schools, we had all the gossip that happened before that. We talked about cancelling the Leaving Cert. Every dog in the street knew the Leaving Cert was going to be cancelled before it was announced, and yet the decision still hadn't been made. And I am conscious that I have 10 minutes here to ask questions and to receive answers that could bring some degree of clarity to the issue. But such is the confusion that reigns amongst schools about how they should reopen. I don't believe I could achieve that if we had the whole afternoon together. I think it is absolutely ludicrous that such is the level of detail that has been provided by this government that I can visualise exactly how pubs are going to open in next week and in three weeks after that. I know about the necessity for a nine euro meal. I know about the social distancing guidelines. And I didn't learn that by osmosis. I learned that because the sectoral interest group there had the year of the government and they got those. Whereas schools that are going to be reopened are still crying out for information. And maybe that will arise tomorrow, but it simply hasn't been the case so far. So, Minister, some of the questions I'm going to ask, I don't expect, I want, to, I want you to paint me a picture, if possible, of what the school would look like in September. I'm not going to do that by just visualising myself walking through a school. Let's imagine any school. Let's imagine any secondary school in Dublin or in your own constituency or in any constituency of any deputy here. I want to imagine that I'm walking up to the door of that, pers of that school in September. And I want to imagine, who's going to, meet me on, who's going to meet me in that school upon arrival to ensure that this affected me hands? Is that going to be the secretary? Is it going to be the deputy principal? And if so, that raises other questions. I mean, if it's a secretary, they've been accessing their own industrial relations last year, so that might bring up issues there. If it's deputy principals, there's been a significant problem with hours allocated to deputy principals. I mean, are we expecting them to spend eight hours every morning, where in some schools only have eight hours of deputy principal time, ensuring children disinfect their hands? You referenced the fact that I was going to ask you where exactly the sanitizer was coming from, but I welcome the fact that you've already brought some degree of clarity to that. As I walk down the corridors, what instructions have been given to the students that I meet along the way? Is that instruction going to be given to them before they start in, in September as to whether it's a one-way system, as to whether some students who have, are immunocompromised might need to have PPE gear, and exactly who is going to provide that PPE gear to the students who may need them? Some would argue all students would meet, need them, but certainly those with immunocompromisation, either in themselves or family members at home, are going to need them. Will that responsibility fall on the school? Will it fall on the department? Or will it fall on their family? As I walk into the classroom, then I'm very conscious of what will that classroom look like. And in particular, I was wondering, would teachers and SNAs, would they be required to wear PPE? And you've suggested that isn't the case. 
But I don't know how we can actually make that determination now, particularly if the virus was to re-emerge over the next couple of months. We said we may not need access to that much PPE. I don't accept that. If a teacher has an immunocompromisation or if the SNA has it, surely they can have as much PPE as they need. Um, I'm also conscious of the role of the SNA in the classroom. And when I, any classroom I've been in, the SNA sits really close to their student. They're whispering constantly. You know, are there going to be instructions given to SNA about the proximity by which they can be engaged with their student? Because any classroom I'm in, that's a very close proximity. But some of those students themselves might be in difficulties or have challenges in terms of their immunocompromisation. So what guidelines will be there? In fact, how many students are even going to be in the classroom? I was appalled over the weekend when a, and I hope it wasn't another kite that was being flown, a report from the SRI or a statement from the SRI suggested that actually we might have to stagger classroom times, that maybe there will only be half the students in the class. And I absolutely would hope that isn't going to be the case. But if that is the case, if that emerges to be the case, where does the department expect the rest of the students to be? And I hope the answer to that isn't at home. Because if it is, it will have a devastating impact on families, but particularly on the most vulnerable, who will be expected to leave their jobs to provide care. And I'm thinking in particular of one pair of families, the vast majority of whom are women at the greatest risk of poverty and deprivation. That department has a responsibility to provide education. We simply cannot abdicate it. And Minister, I'm in no way suggesting you are. I just want to reaffirm that statement. I'm very conscious that if I leave the classroom and I walk towards the staff room, I want to know what measures or what advice am I going to find in the notice board of a staff room. Um, education is always a challenge emotionally for teachers who have to deal with young people, experience various different anxieties that just comes with being a, a young person. But in the age of this pandemic, when young people have had to be in their rooms or haven't had exercise or have had challenges in terms of their living environment, we are facing a wave of emotion that is got, our teachers are going to be on the front line of. And I've talked to any of my friends or anyone I've talked to who's a teacher, they're genuinely concerned about being born out come Christmas by having to deal with that extent. And it's a challenge they're willing to accept, but it shouldn't be one that we enforce on them. So what supports are going to be offered to teachers? And I'm talking about mental health supports in particular. And then there are practical questions. Cleaning staff, for example, and skills. I know in, your, in the report yesterday, it said teachers will be expected to clean up their own cups, and that's absolutely fine. Most teachers do that anyway. But who's going to clean up the canteens? Most schools I know have cleaning staff for two hours a week, or two hours a day. We're going to need vastly more than that. Are the department going to hire more cleaners to help the teachers in that regard? Where divorce may re-emerge, it would make sense that the department takes on more contingent staff if teachers have to cocoon or remove themselves or go on sick. Are we going to hire more staff that can just step in and fill those gaps? And finally, for me, the class of 2021 has already been discussed here on various occasions in this. It's simple. I don't think it's going to be possible the class of 2021 will be able to sit the leave and sit. Traditional leave and sit has been the experience previously. We need a very quick decision made on that. Students shouldn't go back to school in September still whispering as to what leave and sit, what actual exam they'll be taken. So let's avoid guidance on that, Minister. I know you said people are working on it, but great. But can we get some clarity? Or when do you anticipate getting some clarity on that before September starts? I think that's really, really important. So, Minister, I know I asked a lot of questions here. There's absolutely no expectation to answer them all. But if you could just bring some clarity or let us know that there is some clarity forthcoming, I'd be really grateful. Thank you. Thanks, Deputy. Yep, um, happy to do so, Deputy. Mm -hmm. Look, you raised a number of issues there, and um, you asked uh, why we don't have the guidelines today. We don't have them today because the engagement is happening tomorrow with the stakeholders. And one of the uh, central ingredients to this entire process, whether it was in relation to the junior cycle or cancelling the written exams or the calculated grades, was to get buy-in from the stakeholders. And it's been an, an incredibly positive process, and that, that will continue. And it's the only way we'll get to the other side for September. Um, uh, decisions are slow. You're correct, yeah. D decisions can be slow. Uh, but if you consider we were heading for the 95th year of the leaving certificate uh, and within a matter of weeks not alone did we cancel it but we also came up with an entire new system of calculated grades and got the buy-in from the teachers and the schools and it's not the perfect system but that wasn't slow. Uh, I know in the real world of politics we can work on an hour to hour basis or whether uh, it's a day to day basis but uh, the reason why uh, the decision was slow on the cancellation of the leaving certificate was quite evident because you don't announce the cancellation of the leaving cert without having 
a proper alternative or plan B. So that was the reason why it was important that the day that the stakeholders agreed um, to cancel the exams, that they also had to be walked through what the calculated grade system was as well. Um, sorry, Deb, uh, Chairman. You feel that, look, the picture in September, picture in September will be the, the picture in September, and we hope to be in a, a, a much stronger position as well if the country continues uh, to have such a, um, a positive impact in terms of keeping, the, uh, keep, keep, keeping COVID at a, at a very, very low level. Like, we want to move and continue to move, but we're looking and monitoring the likes of Denmark. Denmark are saying we want everybody back in the, the, the classroom in September, the same in France, the same in Northern Ireland. And there's going to have to be very, very close collaboration in ensuring that we get to that point. And I'm confident in September, if you want me to paint a picture, we'll have all students back in, in class studying uh, and preparing for uh, the year ahead. Mm -hmm.